he said, well, I'm probably only going to say this once, but I think I'm a little bit self-destructive. And that stuck with me. In this 2019 interview, Linda Thompson candidly shares the behind-the-scenes truth about her relationship with Elvis Presley during the years 1972 to 1976, and why she and Elvis finally broke up. You know, Elvis, the one, I asked him one time when we were sitting and having a philosophical talk, what do you think is your worst flaw? And he thought for a minute, and he said, well, I'm probably only going to say this once but I think I'm a little bit self-destructive. And that stuck with me, you know, in, in the later years because he recognized it, but he had already started the downward spiral and I don't think he could stop it. Uh, or he felt that he couldn't. And you have to remember in those days, there was not Betty Ford, there were no um, rehab centers that there are today. We had a the Dr. Knott and a Dr. Fink one time um, he, I woke up and I, because I list, you know, once I realized that Elvis took sleeping medication and, and sometimes some other things that maybe interacted with that, I, I, I was like having a newborn baby. I wouldn't sleep. I wanted to know he was okay. So I would sit and watch him until he fell asleep and then I would get up all through the night and had a pattern of wakefulness really to check on his breathing and make sure he was okay. Because sometimes he wasn't. It's it was tough for you. It was exhausting. I have to. I have to admit. I was a young girl, but it was still exhausting when you're not sleeping, and also just emotionally exhausting. Because this is the person that I loved more than my own life, and watching him slowly self-destruct, you know, and and not being able to do anything about it. I didn't have the facilities. I didn't have. The education, I'd never done drugs, I'd never even drank alcohol, I never smoked a cigarette. I was like, I didn't know how to deal with this, you know, except to be there and to try to keep him healthy. And um, so there was this one morning that, you know, he, he wasn't breathing properly, and I had to call an ambulance, and the ambulance came and got him. And there were several times, you know, like that where it was, it was really frightening. And I just, you know, after a while I thought, you know, I do want to get married, I do want to have children, I want to be a mom, and this is not the kind of life I want to bring a child into, this is not, I, I, I finally just thought, you know, I, I can't spend my life trying to keep him alive, That's, that shouldn't be anyone's lot in life. Um, and, and, you know, he, was, he had begun to see other girls. He was, when I wasn't with him, I knew that he would be with someone else. And, you know, you try to reconcile it in your mind and in your heart. I get it. You know, he's so sequestered from other people. I understand if he wants to be around someone new and talk to them. And I knew it wasn't always about having sex with someone else. It was about reading those books and connecting and, you know, getting a little taste of the outside world and what was going on. So logically, I tried to reconcile it in my mind, but emotionally, that was, it's hard. When you love someone, you don't want to think of them with another woman. So it kind of all came to you know, a point in my life where I, I just thought, I don't, I don't think this is the life that I want to sign on for. And we were in San Francisco. He had played the Cow Palace, and he was playing the Cow Palace again the next night. And he said to me, honey, I was thinking maybe you'd want to go back to Memphis and spend a little time with your family. So I brought the jet star in, I brought the plane in, to take you back. Logically, I knew he's not going to bring his private plane in at that expense just to fly me back to Memphis. He's brought someone else in <laughs> to, to go to the show. And that's exactly what had happened. But I said, no, I don't mind flying commercially. I like to fly commercially. I can be around you know, some other people. He said, no, no, I, I brought the plane in just for you. And I said, are you sure you didn't bring another girl in? Because there had been rumors that he was at started dating a girl in Memphis a little behind my back. And I said, are you sure you didn't bring someone else in? And he said, honey, I would never. <laughs> he was so darn charming. And I'll never forget standing there with him in the hotel room. And he said, look at me. 
I love you. I don't love anybody else. You're my little Ariadne Pennington. You're, you're the one that I love. You're, you're my heart, and I don't care whatever you read. Then he's like starting to think that she's gonna hear about this, isn't she? He's like, so honey, I want you to know no matter what you hear, no matter what you read, no matter what anybody tells you, I don't love anybody else. I love you. You're, I'm always gonna love you. And I said, okay, I love you too, knowing that he was lying to me. He was not telling the truth. I know he, he was telling the truth about loving me, and probably at that point in time, I was the only one he loved. But, you know, he had a tremendous capacity to love, and I'm sure he fell in love with the next girl like he had been in love with me. So I, I left him in San Francisco, not of my own will, but because he had brought the plane in. <laughs> so I left, and that's it. You know, it's, it's a song. I left my heart in San Francisco, but it happens to be the last time I ever saw him alive. And I did speak to him on the phone a few times after that, and I just, because I had this haunting feeling, you know, I just thought, that, you know, he's, I don't know if anybody's going to take care of him the way I did. I don't know if anybody's going to be attuned to his needs when you're with someone for that many years and that closely living with them. I felt very attuned to his habits and his needs, and I thought, nobody's going to, nobody else is going to know that. So I remember calling Graceland, <clears throat> pardon me, the Friday night before he died on a Tuesday. And Friday night I called Graceland and Hart, uh, Charlie Hodge answered. And I said, Charlie, hey, it's, it's me. And he said, hey, Linda, how are you doing? I said, good. I, and Elvis and I had been talking on the phone. And I said, can you do me a favor? Is, is Elvis up? And he said, no, honey, he's sleeping. Will you do me a favor? Will you just go upstairs and peek in the door and make sure that he's breathing OK? And Charlie was a little impatient with me. He said, he's fine, honey. He's, he's, he's all right. He's asleep. I said, just you know, humor me, and please go up there and just check on his breathing. So whether he did or not, he pretended to put me on hold and came back to the phone. He said, he's fine, he's, he's okay. And I said, his breathing is good? Yeah, he's fine, he's doing just fine. I said, okay, well just tell him that I called and I love him and I was just checking on him. He said, I'll let him know, he'll, he'll, that'll make him happy. And I didn't speak to him again. And, and then Tuesday, I got the call from Lisa Marie. She said, you know, screaming on the phone, my daddy's dead, my daddy's dead. Watch more of Linda's candid interview on this special playlist on my YouTube channel, and read more in Linda's 2016 memoir, A Little Thing Called Life. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like this video to help this channel grow. For more fascinating facts about Elvis, pick up one of Trina Young's for Elvis books, including her latest, Fact vs. Fiction in the 2022 Elvis movie. Read a free excerpt at elvisbiography.net. Please subscribe to this channel and ring the bell for notifications of future videos. Continue to watch more videos about Linda Thompson and Elvis here.